This is the story of Virgin Atlantic Flight 207. On the 7th of February 2007, a Virgin Atlantic Airbus A340-600 was making the flight from Hong Kong to London. On the ground at Hong Kong, the pilots went over the weather at London. The weather at London wasn't the best, so they needed to go over the alternate airports and the weather at their alternates. For this flight, the alternate was Presswick, Scotland. With the weather stuff out of the way, the three pilots settled in for takeoff. As the jet taxied to the runway, a brief warning flashed on the Electronic Centralized Aircraft Monitor, or the ECAM. On Airbus jets, the ECAM was the go-to display to find out what's wrong with your plane. If you hear something blow up, chances are the ECAM will tell you exactly what blew up and how to combat the situation at hand. On this instant, the error said FCMC fault. But since the warning went away, the crew decided to continue on with the flight. After all, nothing was wrong with the plane right now. With that, the plane lined up and took off at 4.21 p.m. UTC. As the jet climbed away, the fault came on again. The ECAM said FCMC2 fault. The captain did not want to troubleshoot the plane right now as they were in the midst of a climb through some very busy airspace. Whatever was wrong with the plane could wait till they were at cruise altitude. Once at cruise, the captain wanted to reset the computer to see if that would fix the error. Always remember, if you're having trouble with your tech, Turning it off and then back on again is a viable troubleshooting technique, whether it's your $1,000 phone or a $250 million quad engine passenger jet. Unfortunately for the captain, this reset didn't really work as the error persisted. What was weird about this message was that there were no ECAM actions to go along with this error. As alluded to before on Airbus airplanes, when you have an ECAM error, it'll tell you the steps that you needed to take to fix the problem. But here, that was not the case and nothing else seemed to be wrong with the airplane. There were no other warnings or cautions or messages, nothing that would signal that there was anything wrong with this plane. So they decided to push on to London. As they made the long trek to London, the pilots took turns to rest. Staying on the flight deck for the entirety of the flight would violate flying hour limits, and so these breaks were legally required. At about 3 a.m., the captain returned to the flight deck from one of these rests. The plane was in Dutch airspace, and he took control of the plane from the first officer. The night was calm, and the plane cruised at 38,000 feet. It looked like it would be another boring long-haul flight. But then the captain noticed something strange. Engine number one, the leftmost engine, started to spool down. Shortly after that, engine number one lost all power. The engine number one fail warning was lit up on the ECAM. The ECAM actions told the pilots to attempt to restart the engine. But the captain knew that something was up, so he did not attempt to restart, not at that moment anyway. The crew immediately got to work trying to figure out what was wrong with the plane. They then came to the shocking realization that inner tank 1, or the fuel tank that feeds engine number 1, was empty. This should not be happening. The one question on their mind was if they had a fuel leak on board. If they had a fuel leak, it would be a question of when all their engines would fail, not if. The pilots woke up the crew's first officer who was resting at the time, and they got him to check the wings for any fuel that might be streaming out of the plane's wings. But he could see nothing. To make sure that everyone was on the same page in case of an emergency, the pilots got a senior cabin crew member into the cockpit, and they briefed him on what was happening. As they brought the cabin crew member up to speed, the first officer pointed out something to the captain. Engine number four was now starting to die. They watched down as the power generated by engine number four dropped before their very eyes. The captain immediately opened the crossfeed valves. The crossfeed valves basically allow you to move fuel around the plane mid-flight. If you want to feed your right-hand engine with fuel from the left-hand tanks, then the crossfeed valves will let you do that. In this case, the captain was sending fuel from the left-hand side into the tank for engine number four before it could die. Flying without one engine was bad enough. Losing another would have made this much, much more worse. But it looked like his actions had worked. Engine number four recovered. But their ordeal was far from over. Looking at the gauges, he knew that the plane had a serious underlying problem. The tank feeding engine number four was almost empty. Two tanks were now dry. The pilots discussed on what to do. They came to the conclusion that if they were able to relight engine number one, then they would continue on to Heathrow. And if they could not, they'd declare a mayday and then divert. So they busted out the QRH and got to work. Then came the moment of truth. They waited with bated breath to see if engine number one would relight. Well, it did not. Their decision had been made for them. 
But as they were working on the relay, the captain noticed something else while reviewing the fuel system on the plane. The plane was not drawing fuel from the center tank, and the wing tanks only had about 2,700 kilos in each wing. So the captain asked the first officer to transfer some fuel from the center tank to the wing tanks manually. Well, that should fix their issue. As the first officer worked on manually transferring the fuel from the center tank to the wing tanks, the captain put out a mayday call and asked for a diversion to Amsterdam's Kiepel Airport. As soon as the mayday was put out, the first officer had some bad news. The fuel from the center tank would not transfer no matter what he did. Each attempt was met with a trim tank fuel unusable error. This meant that the plane had 25,000 kilos of fuel on board, but only a fraction of that was actually usable. Based on an old FCOM for the A340 that I found, they had about an hour's worth of fuel remaining. This passenger jet might actually run out of fuel with tons of fuel on board. The first officer went through the FCOM and found the fuel TTK XFR fault procedure. Great naming, guys. Maybe that would fix the issue. The crew's first officer carried out the procedure, and to their shock, the fuel in the center tank started to increase. They thought that they were somehow transferring fuel from the wing tanks into the center tank. They thought that they were taking the precious little fuel that they had access to and they were putting it into the center tank, a tank that they could not currently access. The pilots frantically searched for a solution. They found a procedure called fuel CTR slash INR XFR fault. This procedure had a tiny little footnote. It said that if the fuel on board was less than 35 tons, then the center tank would be unusable. Now, the crew took stock of the situation. By their estimate, they'd have about 10 tons of usable fuel remaining. Thankfully, the plane was getting close to Amsterdam. The controllers gave Flight 207 a dedicated frequency due to the precarious nature of the A340. The pilots hoped that nothing else would go wrong with their plane as they lined up with the runway at Schiphol. Then at 4.10 a.m., the plane touched down, ending the ordeal of Flight 207. With the plane safely on the ground and the confusion of the air behind them, everyone could now look to see how a modern airliner could almost just run out of fuel in midair. The first thing that they checked was the plane itself. Engines 1 and 4 did run down due to a lack of fuel in their respective tanks, but inspections showed that the plane had enough fuel on board and that there were no leaks. In the air, the pilots were almost certain that they had a leak, but that was not the case. As with most investigations, the investigators turned to the FDR, or the Flight Data Recorder, and that showed them something interesting. The FDR recorded two faults, the FCMC-1 and FCMC-2 faults. If you've been paying attention, that'll sound familiar to you. Yep, that's the fault that popped up on the ECAM when they were about to take off. So what is the FCMC? The FCMC stands for Fuel Control and Monitoring Computer. The Airbus A340 and most modern airliners have two of these for redundancy's sake. And here, for some reason, both of them failed. Looking into the data, they found out that automatic fuel transfer was taking place on the plane till about 7.34 p.m. UTC. But then, it all stopped. In normal operation, the wing tanks are fed till the center tanks are empty. But the opposite happened here. So at 7.41 p.m., when the inner fuel tank levels dropped below 17,200 kilos or about 38,000 pounds, the master FCMC should have opened the transfer fuel valves into the tank. But it did not. Now the reasons for this gets very technical, but I'll try my best to explain it here. Here's what you need to know. Most subsystems on an Airbus aircraft have a command processor and a monitoring processor. They're like a checks and balance system. The command processor commands stuff and the monitoring processor does its own calculations and independently verifies that the command processor is commanding the right things. If they disagree, then the device, in this case the FCMC, will go, you know what, I'm not reliable, I'm going to hand off control to the slave device or the alternate device. In the case of Flight 207, that did not happen. When FCMC 1 failed, FCMC 2 should have stepped in and taken control. Somehow. Both the master and slave FCMCs had lost all control authority over the fuel pumps. To understand why, we need to look deeper into the electronic guts of the A340. The FCMC sends commands to the valves using a D-out or discrete output card. It's just something that facilitates communication between two systems. But the D-out card can be disabled if the FCMC detects a problem with itself.
On the ground, the engineers put the FCMCs through a gauntlet of tests to figure out what went wrong with them. But both FCMC 1 and 2 passed all the tests that the engineers threw at them. For whatever reason, both of them failed, and that left the fuel valves on the plane in a sort of no man's land. Looking deeper into the relationship between the two FCMCs, they found out that one FCMC was the master and the other one was the slave. Basically, the healthier of the two was the master and the other one was the slave. On the ground at Hong Kong, FCMC 2 failed, but this warning was inhibited. Later on in the air, when they got to know that the FCMC failed, they tried to reset it using a circuit breaker, but it was still in the failed state. Then FCMC 1 failed. But they both failed in different ways. In the case of FCMC 2, the Arink bus A and bus B failed. Bus A and bus B will be important later on. But for the FCMC 1, bus A and bus B were functional. Here's the gist of what you need to know. In this case, both FCMCs were messed up, but FCMC 1 was more messed up than FCMC 2. That's why control was not handed from 2 to 1, because by comparison, FCMC 2 was the better computer. But this is a modern airliner. When the FCMCs failed, some other warning should have come up, right? Well, it should have, but on flight 207, it did not. The first indication of trouble for the crew, that something was wrong, was when the plane started to yaw due to engine 1 losing thrust. How did that happen? Well, when the fuel in the inner tanks dipped below 17,200 kilos of fuel, it should have triggered an alarm, but it did not. Had that happened, the ECAM actions would have told the pilots to manually transfer fuel. All of this was due to the failure of the Arink A and B buses on FCMC2. These buses helped the FCMC generate warnings, and since they were out of commission, and since the control wasn't handed over to FCMC1, the crew got zero warnings about the danger that their plane was in. This also explains the whole fuel transferring into the center tank debacle. You have to remember that these pilots were probably stressed out of their minds. As far as they were concerned, this was quickly turning into air trans at flight 236 2.0. On top of that, they were in the middle of a diversion. It was during all of this that they commanded a fuel transfer. You see, on Airbus aircraft, when fuel is transferred between tanks, you get these little arrows that specify the direction in which the fuel is being transferred. But due to the failure of the FCMC, those never popped up. So, when the pilots looked at the fuel gauges, they saw the fuel values in the center tank going up due to fuel from the trim tanks being sent into the center tanks. This just confused the crew. They had no errors to indicate fuel transfer direction and the fuel quantity in the center tank was going up. In reality, a few minutes later, fuel from the center tank began to flow into the wing tanks. But they still was not sure about the state of the fuel system on the airplane, and that's why they diverted. Better to be safe than sorry, eh? That's everything that happened with Flight 207, but our story does not end there. Looking into the history of the Airbus A340-600, they found out that this wasn't an isolated incident. The FCMC failed on a lot of Airbus A340-600s. Here's a quote from the report. A flight crew would typically have expected to see the FCMC 1-2 fault on half of their sectors. End quote. Half of their sectors. Half. In those cases, it was due to the clocks and the command and monitoring lines getting out of sync. There was an easy way to fix this. It was just to trip the FCMC using the circuit breaker. And if you did not trip it for long enough, then the problem would not be fixed. That's probably what happened in this case. But whatever the cause of the problem, it was just so common that maintenance crews just ended up ignoring the problem. I mean, they just expected the pilots to pull a few circuit breakers and then fix the problem themselves. In the end, these stopgap solutions just stopped working and it almost ended with a giant passenger jet running out of fuel in the skies over Europe. That's just absolutely scary. What do you think of all of this? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to watch another similar video that I did on the Airbus subsystems, then I highly recommend that you watch my video on SmartLynx Airlines Flight 9001. You're going to love it. Link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.